my friend. I've been blessed by watching all these kids tonight. Oh my, are they beautiful. Uh, those precious girls are so beautiful and the guys are, well, the girls are beautiful anyway, all right? They're just beautiful, beautiful, precious kids and watching them up here. And uh, thank you for all your kindness. Uh, Brother Marshall, Jonathan Marshall was kind enough to pick me up at the airport and has been so gracious getting to be with him. I had no idea a Honda van went 120 miles an hour. I didn't know that. And when I told him, boy, 120, oh, it'll go 130, and it will, and it will. No, he didn't do that. We were over 100, but not a lot, okay? <laughs> no. He has just been superb in getting to be with his precious wife and their kids. And uh, just thanks for all of your graciousness. Your pastor has treated us so kindly, and it's been a thrill for us to get to be here. If you have your Bibles tonight, Psalm 3, please. Psalm 3. I uh, changed my message tonight. I don't do that very often, but I want to go back to Psalm 3. Please remember, your vote coming up is a sacred responsibility. And can I just remind you, your vote does not belong to you. You don't belong to you. The Bible says you have been purchased at an incredible price. And then it says these words, and ye are not your own. And that vote you cast, you are casting on behalf of the cause of Christ. And to say, I'm not going to take my vote which belongs to the Lord and I'm not going to cast it, that's horrible. But boy, you, you make sure you're casting it in such a way that heaven says, well done. Well done. And make sure that responsibility uh, is something we as Christians, I think sometimes we get caught up in the rhetoric, our vote, my vote. No, no, no. I belong to him. And this vote is for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm giving it. And I want to encourage you with your faith promise coming up here. You will only be upset with pastor when you get to heaven about one thing. And that is that he didn't encourage you to give more. When you see the eternal reward that is not yours for a long time, it's not yours for a very long time, when you see the reward that is yours forever, you're going to go to this man of God and say, why didn't you get us to do more? Look at this eternal reward. So, boy, you take this faith promise time. And remember, two kinds of givers. There's the polite givers. Well, you got to give something. And then there's the faith givers. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, boy, make sure you're not giving politely by calculation. Make sure you are giving by faith. Remember, faith is what you hope for. And, boy, make sure you do that. I'm excited to hear you're doing faith promise. And, Pastor, thank you for leading this precious flock in order to do something that's going to give them literally eternal reward. How many of you believe God saw every penny that went in that jar tonight? He does. And boy, there will be a reward for every bit of it. Psalm 3 is a psalm written by David during a very harrowing and difficult time in his life. His son Absalom has risen up against him and is trying to literally destroy his father, violating every principle of honor that you can imagine. And the devil made a pitch bid to get the heart and the mind of David. And in Psalm 3, we find David's response to that bid the devil put on him. Tonight, I'll ask you a simple question. What neighborhood do you live in? We say, Brother Gibbs, I, I live in Ohio, I live in Toledo, I live in Michigan, I live... No, no, no. 
That's geographically where you live. Where do you live? Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2 are the neighborhood the devil wants you to live in. It's the neighborhood the devil's going to do everything in his power to get you to live in. He is going to try with every minion of ability that he can muster to get you, to get me, to get your pastor to live in verse 1 and 2. But God wants you to live in verse 3 and 4. And which neighborhood do you live in? Boy, we know that the devil made a bid to get David into the wrong neighborhood, verse 1 and 2. And I promise you, if you've been a Christian any length of time, you know the devil has made a bid to get you into that neighborhood. But God says, I don't want you there. I want you in verse 3 and 4. But the choice is yours. If you're only going to remember one thing as a child of God that I say tonight, if you're living in the wrong spiritual neighborhood, it's because you personally chose to do so. No Christian has to live in verse 1 and 2. By the grace of God, we can live in verse 3 and 4. Now let's take a look at these neighborhoods. Let's start out Psalm chapter 3, start with verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Wow, the people that bug me, that irritate me, they're like everywhere, and they're multiplying how many of you know some irritating people? <laughs> maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's people at work. All I know is, doesn't matter where you go, they're everywhere. And you know what the devil wants? You and I to be focused on those people that are bugging us, that are irritating us. I was at a church in California and something happened on a Sunday morning that if I live to be 400, I won't forget. The pastor's secretary came to me in the lobby and she said, there's, there's a little room down to the side over here, a prayer room. Preacher would like you to go down there. He'll meet you there for prayer. I said, great. I am walking down the aisle. The auditorium is packed. I want to say there were 2,500, maybe 3,000 people there that Sunday morning. And I'm going down the aisle, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a lady jumps up. I don't know her, but she jumped up, she grabbed me, and she started kissing the side out of my face. <laughs> now, your pastor tells me that's happened occasionally to him. That never happened to me before. No, it didn't happen to him. I want to make that clear. <laughs> He's almost passed out over there right now. <laughs> I mean, like a machine gun, she grabs me and is going on the side of my face. And you know what she said? Oh, Brother Gibbs, we just love you. Just kissing my face to pieces. And I'm like, sweet Alabama. <laughs> Who in the fire are you? And you're nuts. <laughs> now, I don't know what you'd respond, but I mean, it's so, star I dropped my Bible. <laughs> I did, I dropped it. And I said, you stop that, you be good. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And I'm looking around, all kinds of people are looking at me, and I'm like, I don't know her. <laughs> she takes a step backwards, and I go to get my Bible, and she jumps up and does it again. <laughs> Grabs me around the neck, all over the side of my face. I said, you sit down and don't move. Now, a lady jumped up and she said, oh, Brother Gibbs, you got lipstick all over the side of your face. So I took my hanky out and I'm wiping. Man, here a lot. I thought, man, this hanky not going home. No way, man. This is a mess. <laughs> Do 
You talk about startled. You talk about never expected. I walked down the aisle backwards, telling that lady, don't you move. <laughs> now I get down to the front, and the associate comes running up. And he said, oh, Brother Gibbs, I'm so sorry. I said, well, that, that woman's nuts. I said, you, you need to put a handler on her. I said, you, if she comes to church, you need to put someone with her. Don't let her loose. Oh, he said, preacher's going to kill me for that. I said, no, 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 come on, you just got a nutty lady. He said, no, 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 you don't understand, preacher's going to kill me. I said, why would preacher kill you? I said, you just got a nutty lady. He said, well, Brother Gibbs, that's not a lady. I said, what'd you say now? <laughs> he said, that's a man who dresses like a lady. I said, preacher, not going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I went to pieces. I thought, the one time I'm mugged, it's not even a woman. <laughs> you talk about how are they increased that trouble me? Boy, I went down. That, 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 that person's cologne was on my coat. I, I, I said, I can't preach. I, I'm telling you, I went to pieces. You know what? The devil knows how to get somebody to get under your skin and trouble you and get you into the neighborhood of verse 1 and 2. Wow. I remember telling the preacher there, I said, you, you got to get somebody else to preach. I said, I can't preach. I am just, I mean, I was shaking. He said, Brother Gibbs, I'm so sorry, but he said, the devil's doing everything he can to defeat you this morning. And he sent that perversion to trouble you. And he said, do you understand the only hope that person has is Jesus Christ? By the way, that's the only hope any of us have is Jesus Christ. Boy, if I could go up and down these rows. Man, that story comes back to me. It still gets me upset. And it was 25 years ago. The devil will want you to keep bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up to get your mind on that so he can drag you to the neighborhood of verse 1 and 2. Look at the second thing he says. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Wow. Many are they which rise up against me. Have you ever had somebody take a shot at you? Well, after all we did for them. After all the kindness we showed, and, and look at what they're doing to us now. And boy, it can hurt you. And sometimes we forget we're commanded to forgive. We're commanded to let it go. We're commanded to drop it. But boy, how the devil brings it back. And suddenly people who rose up against you who rose up against me, all of a sudden those memories all come back. We had a man write an article about us and send it everywhere. 
And he confused us with some other people and said horrible things about us. Never talked to us. And boy, did I get mad. How many of y'all have ever gotten ticked off? And, and you know what? I thought, you want to play word games? We'll play word games. I'm going to make you regret the day you were born. You know what I decided to do? I was so mad about that article and how they rose up against us. I decided I'm going to sue you once a day, every day for 30 straight days. I am going to put 30 different lawsuits on you. Your lawyer is going to become your best friend on the planet. And man, I had all these ideas. And, and I called our lawyers and I said, I want you to get ready when I come back into town on Monday. Man, I want your ideas. We are going to sue him blue. And I felt wonderful. Man, here I am planning vengeance and man, I'm, I'm, I'm not only living in verse 1 and 2, I'm dwelling there now. I came in the office and my secretary, Mrs. Block, who's now in heaven, was standing there and she said, oh, I saw the article. I said, yeah. And she said, well, it's a lie. That's not true. I said, I know. And she said, well, I know what you're going to do. I said, yeah, man, we're going to sue him. We're going to teach, I'm telling you, he is going to, surely, he is going to be so fouled up the rest of his life. We got all the, I'm telling you, it's going to be great. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, no, you're a Christian. You're going to love him and do good to him and forgive him, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> right after I sue him 30 times. <laughs> Never forget what she said, she said, Brother Gibbs, it takes a whole lifetime to get a good name. It takes one day to trade it away. She said, promise me you won't do that. Now, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Lord, right now, I don't need a secretary who knows the Bible. I just don't. <laughs> She said, no, promise me. I said, okay, Shirley, I promise. She said, well, I knew you'd want to tell him you love him, so I've dialed him up and he's on line five. <laughs> and do you understand? I didn't want out of verse one and two. I wasn't done getting even. She lifts up the phone, hits that little blinking button, and says, here, just tell him you love him. And, and she was Italian. She, she would do this. She'd say, just tell him. And I'm like, just leave. <laughs> I said, hello? And the guy cussed at me. <laughs> Used horrible profanity. He said, blankety blank, why'd you call me blankety blank blank? I surely heard it. She said, tell him you love him. <sighs> now you understand the Bible says if you have an enemy, you're commanded by God to love them, do good to them, pray for them. Whew. I said, I, I, I just called you to tell you I love you. And I thought, that sounded stupid. <laughs> And, 
And he said, blankety blank blank, that's not what you called. You're just saying that to cast coals of fire on my head. And you know what I thought? If that thought had come to me, I'd have done it. <laughs> you know what happens when somebody rises up against you? All of a sudden, you go into the war mode. And you are in verse 1 and 2. Well, Brother Gibbs, you haven't had to put up with my mother-in-law. You haven't put up with my boss. You don't know our neighbor. You're right, I don't. All I know is they're everywhere. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Look at the next word. Many are they that rise up against me. Verse 2. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. Selah. You know, we teach the kids a little nursery rhyme. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but names can never hurt me. It's not true. Boy, read James 3. The power of the tongue Boy, you can hurt people with words unspeakably. How many of you know the world's full of Eeyores? How many of you know who Eeyore is? Hold your hand up. Great Bible character, or he ought to be. <laughs> He's in the book of Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore's the guy who's always going to kill the hope in you. Great day, Eeyore. Yeah, but it didn't over yet. <laughs> and boy, there's people that are like little walking hoovers. All they want to do is suck the hope out of you. <laughs> and you know what God says? They're everywhere. And if you're not careful, you will live in verse 1 and verse 2. That's where you'll dwell. And the kids know where you live. Because how many of you are aware kids can hear everything you don't want them to hear? And they know what's there. But David said, I'm not living in verse 1 and 2. Look at verse 3. But thou, O Lord. And then he says, there's three things to change your neighborhood. But thou, O Lord, number one, art a shield for me. Can I ask you a question? Are you behind the shield? Now, the Bible says in Ephesians, it's the shield of faith. And the Bible says in Ephesians, above all taking the shield of faith. God said, of everything I give you, be sure you get the shield of faith, above all. And he says, it's able to quench Every fiery dart of the devil, every single one, no exceptions. Why would you want to live where the devil's got a clean shot at you? Where he's got a clear shot at your family, at your wife, at your kids, at your husband. When God says, I got a shield that will quench every fiery dart the devil can hurl. But you got to get behind that shield. It's there, and above all, taking the shield of faith. Did you live behind the shield today? Did you live behind it? You'll never be there by accident. It's a decision. And are you behind that shield? Oh, it changes everything. We, we have a, a very good friend, Pastor and I do together, and he's been a man who's preached here, Brother DeMichael. How many of you know Brother DeMichael? Well, his church is a, a very phenomenal church, a great church. But they invited Steve Kluth and I to come do a men's meeting for him, and we said we would go. And he said, well, now when you come, he said, our men's meeting is a very manly thing. And I said, yeah, right, men. No, no, he said, I mean, it's manly. And I thought, well, what are we, dress wearers or what? I don't know what you're talking about. 
He said, it's just manly. Great people. Oh, great men. I had no idea how manly they were. The first event at the men's outing was a boxing match. <laughs> they got no headgear. And the way you win is when the other guy can't get up. And all the guys are standing around saying, get back up, you sissy, get up, get up. Kapow, they hit him again. Teeth are coming out. They're splitting lips, splitting eyebrows. And he said, that's okay, we got paramedics here, they'll stitch them up. And they said, don't you want to do this, Brother Gibbs? I said, no, 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 no. I said, when you do sumo wrestling, I'll do that one, all right? <laughs> but I don't want to get up there and have some guy tear my face to pieces. But it got better. The next event was they lined everybody up in two lines about as far apart as this auditorium is wide, and they gave everybody a paintball gun fully loaded. Now, they got no protection. And they're shooting at each other with paintball guns. It was amazing. I mean, right off, a guy goes, pow, eagle. I thought, oh, they killed him. <laughs> Man, I think it may not be murder one, but that's for sure murder two. <laughs> Good night. When their paint guns are all empty, if you're still in, they move each side forward 10 feet and do it again and then again. They beat each other to pieces. Pow, pow, pow. And I'm thinking, your mama dropped you on your head or something. <laughs> Just fall down and play dead. Man alive. Watching those guys pop each other and hurt each other and cause pain is absolutely nothing compared to you not being behind the shield of faith. Because you know what you're saying to the devil? Go ahead. Take a clean shot. Pow, pow, pow. And every fiery dart he's firing, you're taken, your kids are taken, your mates taken, because you're not behind the shield. Why in our right minds would we stand out there where the devil can get a clean shot? When God says, I got a shield that he can get nothing past, nothing. It will quench every fiery dart the devil has. David, man, verse 1 and 2. Oh, he said, I know. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Oh, Brother Gibbs, the words. Man, the betrayal. Get behind the shield of faith that's able to quench every fiery dart. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. All I can promise you is we all go through a lot. And God says, I want you behind my shield. Dad, did you get the family behind the shield? Mom, are the kids behind the shield? 
or have we been dragged to verse 1 and 2? God says, don't live there. The first key to changing neighborhoods is saying, by God's grace, I'm getting behind the shield of faith. Look at the second key. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Look at his next words, two words, my glory, my glory. Now please underline this. Boy, these words are powerful. Brother Gibbs, I'm not quite sure what that means. It's not complicated. My glory means everything I need is you. God, you don't need to make any of this go away. You don't need to change anything. All I need is you. You are my glory. Brother Marshall, you ever sing the song, He's All I Need? All, all I need. Is he all you need? Well, now God, wait, wait a minute. You mean a lot to me, but I'm telling you, you want me happy? You got to fix this. You got to make this go away. God, you... What are you saying? Oh, no, he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. But is he... Your glory. Your glory. Is he everything to you? Your pastor has traveled to third world countries. Many of you have too. And, and when you're there, it amazes me. The Christians come in and they have nothing. Most of them don't have shoes. And, and they have the best clothes on that they have, but they're rags. And, and they don't drive to church. Their dream is to own a bicycle and they'll never get a bicycle. But they come to church and they're happy. And, and you say, how can you people be happy? You don't have anything. And you know what they say? Brother Gibbs, we got everything. We got him. Do you need more than him? Or is he your glory? Wow. Can I confess to you, I think some of you might be doing, sometimes I think we act like spoiled kids. You want me to be happy? Well, then you, no, no, no. All I need is you. That's all. You're my glory. When I was eight years old, my mother contracted polio. And I can still vividly remember the morning when she got it. I, I walked downstairs to eat breakfast. My mom's at the stove. And she said, Davy, run, get your dad. I think I'm really sick. And my mom walked out of the kitchen into the living room, laid down on the couch, and never walked again. Polio, spinal meningitis, had come to our house. My mom gasped and fought for breath. Blood vessels were breaking in her face everywhere, and she couldn't breathe. Her nervous system was under a vicious attack. When the ambulance got there, they walked in and took a thing that looked like a screwdriver and punched a hole in my mother's throat. And she was in so much pain. And I heard him tell my dad, we'll try to get her to the hospital, but I don't think she's going to make it. And I thought, what do you, what do you mean she's not going to make it? I did not know when they took her out the door that I wouldn't see her for two years. I didn't know we'd live for phone calls. That she'd be in her iron lung fighting for life. And I got upset with God. My mom was the church pianist. 
conservatory trained. We, we had our own key to the church. We were the first to come, the last to leave. My dad, if church doors were open, we were there. And you know what happened to me? I thought, God, if this is how you treat your best, I don't understand it. This isn't right. For two years, we didn't get to see my mom. And finally, they arranged for my sister and I to be able to see my mother. How many of you guys have a sister? How many of you have one? How many of you understand the problem that is in life, right? Just. <laughs> my sister's such a great lady, but I was always in trouble. She was never in trouble. She always made straight A's. I was thrilled to pass each year. We're going to go see my mom, and I'll never forget. We're not going to get to be by her because they still think she's extremely contagious. But we're going to go up about three, four floors and stand by a window in a little courtyard, and they're going to wheel her iron lung across the courtyard and going to see it. And I know that don't sound like much, but when you haven't seen your mom in two years, you have no idea what that means. Now, all the way to the hospital, my sister kept saying, now keep your mouth shut. You always say stupid things. <laughs> and I said, Garnet, I just want to see her. She said, I know. But don't say something stupid. Well, we get up there. Here's this little speaker. We're looking across the little courtyard. We're supposed to be there at 10 o'clock. I think we were there at 9.30. 10 o'clock comes and goes. Now it's 10.30, maybe 10.40. And a nurse comes up and she said, are you the Gibbs kids? We said, yeah. And she said, well, your mom's having a real bad day. We've tried to move her several times, and she can't breathe. And we've had to revive her a couple times. But she wants to see you. Don't leave. And I remember thinking, is it too much just to see her, God? Is that too much to ask for? Finally, an hour later, they wheel her iron lung up, and boy, that thing scared me, making all that noise. And her head is turned the wrong way, and I heard my mom say, gasping, turn my head so I can see my kids. And when they were very gracious, but when they tried to turn her head, she just screamed in pain. And I thought, he took her hands. She can't play. She can't breathe. Could you have left her neck? Would that have been too much to ask for, God? And my sister's just squeezing the fire out of my hand. And she's saying real quiet, don't say anything. Don't say it. And I was upset. Finally, they got my mom quieted back, and now she's looking at us. And what she said next changed my life. She didn't say, hello, how are you? She looked at me, and she said, Davy, don't you think that? How many of you know moms can read their kids' faces? And I did what every kid does. I lied. I said, don't think what, Mom? What she said next, she could have taken me to verse 1 and 2 like that, but she didn't. She said, son, this isn't what I planned, but he's doing all things well, and he is my glory.
when life puts a hug on you, where do you take the kids? Where do you take your friends? Where do you take yourself? Now, I want to tell you, I sat there and I thought, Mom, if it makes you feel better to say that. But I looked at her and I thought, my soul, she means it. She really believes her God is doing all things well. And that her Savior is all she needs. Well, it is what the Bible says. But if we're not careful, we forget He is our glory. Wow. David. Man, you're having a rough road. Life's not going so good for you. He said, I know, but I got a shield. And my God is my glory. He's all I need. Ever bit of it. Look at the third and final thing. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I can promise you life can bring some stuff that will bow your head. But God says, you live in verse 3 and 4, I'll lift your head. I'll lift it. It was a long time before my mom got home. And when she got home, I mean, she's strapped in a wheelchair. She can't do anything. She can't breathe. We got all this breathing apparatus and... But she's home, and boy, that was huge. And our pastor came to see us, and it was a very bad day. Now, the pastor came in to see us, and I I understood what he meant now. I sure didn't understand at the time. I mean, it took all morning to get my mom so she could see him. And he came in, and he said, Mrs. Gibbs, I, I just want to tell you, the church voted to not have you folks come back. We're afraid of your disease. And I thought to myself, what do you mean you voted to not have us come back? Even if you did it, you didn't have to say it. And my mom, real polite, she said, I I understand. She said, it is scary. But she said, would you at least pray that God would give me something to do for him? And what the preacher said next is what corked me. He said, Mrs. Gibbs, you need to understand God's through with you. And I thought, you may be right, but you're not going to say it to my mom. I am going to knock your teeth out of your head. (laughs) I was halfway across the room to deck our pastor. I was going to fix it where he brushed his teeth out the back of his neck. (laughs) And I mean, he saw me coming and he started whelping up. And I was, I've never hit anybody in my life, but I was going to hit the preacher. Talk about a career ending move. (laughs) And my mom said, you stop, you stop. Well, I looked at her and she said, for me, stop. She said, Pastor, you're wrong. I still got breath. And if you got breath, God's got something to do. Can I remind you, you'll know when God's through with you. You'll be looking at him. Until that day, he has something for you to do. And he said, well, if that makes you feel better, and my mom said, no, pastor, 
I got a God who lifts my head. I never forgot that. He does all things well, Davy. And he's my glory. And she'd say, I so miss the piano and the music. She said, you just don't know how bad. But he's all I need. Is that true for you? Another preacher came to see us. He was starting a church in town. He said, I understand you guys have had a bad time. And he said, I just wanted to come tell you I'm praying for you and and my mom said, well, thank you. And then she said, could you just pray, God, and give me something to do for him? And I thought, Mom, you can't dress yourself, you can't eat, you can't breathe. She said, but I'm still alive. And I like what this preacher said. He said, I don't know what it is, but God's got something for you. And like that, the guy gets on his knees in our carpet in the living room and starts praying for my mom. God, give her something to do. You spared her life for a reason, God. Now, give her something. And halfway through the prayer, he stopped, and he's on his knees. And I thought, I like him because he likes my mom. <laughs> and he said, you know, we don't have any people. And he said, because we don't have any people, we don't have any kids. So because we don't have any kids, we don't have a Sunday school. But we're going to have a Sunday school. And he said, how would you like to run the Sunday school that doesn't have any kids? And I thought, what is he talking about? <laughs> he said, because one day we will have kids. And my mom said, I'd love that. She said, kids are not afraid of me. Kids come up while adults stand way far away. And I'd love to do that. Now, when he left, I thought, this is goofy. I said, mom, if you don't have kids, you don't have a Sunday school. And she said, well, we got two. And I said, who? She said, you and your sister. And I thought, oh, no. You talk about a curse. Go to Sunday school the rest of your life with your sister. She said, son, he's lifting my head. What's been lifting your head? Trying to do it on your own? Oh, I promise you, life can throw a curve you're not ready for. Not quite seven years later, that Sunday school that had no kids, never, never had less than 5,000 children in it. And it was run by a lady who couldn't trust herself. But she had a God who was all she needed, and a God who lifted her head. Wow. My mom outlived everybody who had polio with her by 35 years. And we'd take her to the doctor, and the doctors would say, Mrs. Gibbs, you got nothing that works. I mean nothing. We don't understand how you're alive, and you're happy. How in the world? And these doctors would come in at the Cleveland Clinic and they'd say, could we just take a picture with you? They said, you smile. And she said, well, you got to understand, I got somebody who lifts my head. And they'd say, you taking drugs or something? She said, no, 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 it's the Lord Jesus. Wow. I was in a trial and I got called out. It was my wife, Gloria Ann, and she said, honey, your mom just went home to be with the Lord. 
we laid her down to take a nap, and she woke up in heaven. But she said, I got to tell you, she died with the biggest smile on her face you have ever seen. And the ambulance that came to get her, they're all taking pictures of her because they said, we've never seen a smile like that in our life. To the end, he is the lifter up of my head. Where have you been living? Oh, many are they that trouble me. Those that rise up against me, which say of me there's no hope for him. But I have a shield, and you are my glory, and you are the lifter up of my head. Now look at one thing in the next verse and we're done. How do I get there? I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. When's the last time you asked God to put you in verse 3? I cried unto the Lord. Prayer is that triggering agent that changes neighborhoods. I don't know where you lived last week. It's irrelevant because you don't have to live there next week. You can change the direction of your life by simply asking God. I want to be behind your shield of faith. And by your grace, by your power, you're all I need. You are my glory. And you are the lifter up of my head. A thousand times, Brother Sewell, I thought, Mom, thank you. Boy, could you have parked me in the wrong neighborhood? And Mom, I don't know if I'd ever got out because I was bitter. I was upset. But you took me to the right neighborhood and it changed me forever. Where do you live? Tonight, I encourage you. It's time to simply cry unto the Lord. He wants to be your shield of faith. And he wants to be your glory. And by his grace, he will be the lifter up of your head. Father, thank you. Oh my, these precious people. And God, by your grace, we don't have to live in verse 1 and 2. By your grace, we can live in verse 3 and 4. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, God spoke?